Good evening. Thanks for your patience. I'm Tom Nastic, public program producer for the National Archives, and I'd like to welcome you to the McGowan Theater at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and a special welcome to those watching on C-SPAN, as well as on the National Archives YouTube channel. We're very pleased to present tonight's discussion on the historic connections between the temperance and women's suffrage movements of the late 18th and early 20th centuries, or 19th and early 20th centuries. Tonight's distinguished panel is moderated by Paige Harrington, executive director of the Sewell Belmont House and Museum, and includes Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, university president emerita, Morgan State University, Lori Osborne, archivist and president of the Francis Willard Historical Association, and Christina Myers, program director at the Alice Paul Institute. The program is presented in celebration of Women's History Month and in conjunction with the National Archives exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History, now on display upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. Before we get to tonight's program, I'd like to tell you about a couple of other programs we'll be presenting in this theater. On Tuesday, April 7th at noon, historian Terry Alford will be here to discuss his book, Fortune's Fool, The Life of John Wilkes Booth. And on Friday, April 10th at 7 p.m., public television talk show host Tavis Smiley will be joined by National Public Radio's Michelle Martin in a discussion of Smiley's recent book, My Journey with Maya, which recounts the story of his enduring friendship with the poet Maya Angelou. This program is presented in partnership with the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. Book signings will follow both of these programs, and both will be streamed on the National Archives YouTube channel. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its education and outreach programs. Pick up your application for membership in the lobby. As I mentioned, tonight's program is tied to our new exhibit, Spirited Republic, which uses nearly 100 National Archives documents and artifacts to reveal the federal government's efforts, successes, and failures to change our drinking habits. Just a few examples related to tonight's topic include the 1888 petition from the National Women's Christian Temperance Union calling for a prohibition amendment to the United States Constitution, a design patent from 1891 for a temperance badge, and an identification card from 1921 for Daisy Simpson, one of a handful of women agents of the Treasury Department's Prohibition Bureau. The exhibit runs through January 10, 2016, so I hope you will have a chance to come and see it. But now to bring us deeper into the topic, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Paige Harrington, Executive Director of the Sewell Belmont House and Museum. Previously, Paige served as the Vice President of Operations of the United States Navy Memorial and as an architectural historian at the preservation firm of architect Milford Wayne Donaldson. In addition to her work at the Sewell Belmont House and Museum, Paige serves on the Board of Directors for the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. Would you please welcome Paige Harrington and our panel. Thank you, Tom. It's wonderful to be here again this evening. I would say happy Women's History Month, but I guess I will say instead happy very last few hours of Women's History Month. But we are still very delighted to be here tonight. I hope that um, some of you have taken the opportunity to see the exhibit upstairs. It is absolutely fantastic. And I wouldn't um, be the executive director of the Sewell Belmont House unless I also made a plug for the Sewell Belmont House. I hope that you can take a, take a look at the wonderful archive and the museum that we have on the corner of Second and Constitution. So our program tonight will allow us to talk in greater detail about the intersections between temperance and suffrage. So they, they are a little bit hazy in history. And what we have found, this panel and I, as we've been preparing for this, is that there's not a whole lot of recent, most recent scholarship on this. So the track that we decided to take was to really look at the women themselves, because it was the women whose um, thoughts and origins and what they were fighting for for their families and their nation went into the organizations that they were then able to move forward, and that became the movement themselves. So we'll talk a little bit about this, um, the way that the women galvanized for um, social, economic, and political change. By the mid-1880s, excessive alcohol consumption and domestic violence against women was a serious problem. The temperance issue was of concern to many women who felt that the widespread alcohol, alcoholism caused detrimental 
effects to the family and to married life, particularly because married women at the time had few legal rights or remedies. The suffrage movement can trace its beginning to Seneca Falls in 1848, and while the legal right to vote was the ultimate goal for the women, over the next 70 plus years, there were many areas of overlap between temperance and suffrage, including improved working conditions for wage earning women, the need for a strong public education system, and of course, full political equality. Taken together, these reform movements can be Taken together, the reform movements can be seen as a fascinating study of the individuals who participated in both movements and the organizations they created. Tonight, we will focus on a small group of women leaders, including Frances Willard, Mamie Dillard, Frances Harper, and Alice Paul. Together, the women's leadership really enabled a whole nation of women to gather, unite, and work to bring um, change to our nation. As Tom said, tonight we will hear from Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn. We also have Lori um, Osborne from Evanston History Center and Christina Myers from Alice Paul Institute. So we will move right into the moderated part of this discussion. And I think we're going to be a few minutes behind. So I will start with Chris. Mm -hmm. And if you could talk a little bit about the early influences in Alice Paul's life. So talk a little bit about how did that influence her? What about her upbringing and her family could have influenced her later on as she became a reformer in her own right? Sure, I think, uh, you know, Alice Paul, she was a Quaker, as uh, many of our suffragists are, um, but she was particularly, she was a Hicksite Quaker. Uh, so she was following, uh, her family followed the principles of Elias Hicks, who advocated, you know, getting away from uh, the materialism of life and uh, getting back to nature and getting back to uh, the morals of humanity. Uh, so it did tend to be the, the Hicksite Quakers who were the activists. They were the abolitionists. Um, they tended to get into suffrage, not quite the suffrage that Alice Paul will get into, uh, but they do tend to be the activists or the reformers at least. Uh, I think, you know, her mother was a, a suffragist and we know that Alice Paul was brought to her first suffrage meetings uh, in her hometown in uh, Mount Laurel or Moorestown, New Jersey. Um, we know that that had some influence, uh, but it's really not um, until in her 20s when she starts to become involved in suffrage. I think what Quakerism did for her, uh, she grew up in a very small Quaker community. It was completely Quaker in southern New Jersey. Uh, she grew up with the idea that men and women are equal, um, you know, that they had roles to play, active roles to play in life uh, and in the community. Um, she grew up with a sense of a social duty um, mm -hmm. that you have to make the world a better place. And that is something that she did take very seriously. Uh, and she also grew up with the, the principle of nonviolence. And that's something that she will have to answer to when she becomes uh, a militant suffragist, as she's called. Uh, I think that as a Quaker, all of these principles and more are just part of her daily life uh, in this Quaker community. It's something that she, she grew up with. It was something that she practiced uh, at school, um, in her colleges. She, she went to Swarthmore College. Uh, later on, she went to Penn, but particularly at Swarthmore, a Quaker institution. Um, these principles were just ingrained in their daily lives. So this concept of equality uh, and um, the sameness of, of everyone around uh, is, is interesting, because I think it is when uh, she works in the settlement movement and uh, later uh, um, she's working as a social worker that she steps outside of that Quaker bubble. And I think that really does have an impact on her uh, in New York and later on in London. And I think that's really what's going to help her to become a suffragist when she realizes that life is not so equal on the outside of the Quaker community. And uh, she starts to see what women are experiencing in some of these um, uh, communities that she sees uh, in New York and in London. Uh, so I think as a Quaker, um, this principle of equality, it, it sounds so big, but uh, it's something that even at the age of 92, she's still talking about that concept of equality and how ordinary it is and, and how much she believed in it. Uh, and I think that's ultimately what brought her into uh, the women's suffrage movement and made her a lifelong activist uh, for, for women and equality. 
And we'll talk a little bit more as we move forward about the single-mindedness of Alice and, and certainly a lot of the other women as well. Can you give us a little bit of a background on Alice Paul Institute and tell us a little bit about what you do now? Sure. The Alice Paul Institute was founded, we are 30 years old this year, uh, officially founded in 1985. And the Institute is housed at Alice Paul's uh, home in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Uh, her old, she called it the home farm. Uh, but the house has been preserved not as a historic house museum, but as a women's history center and a girls' leadership development center. We thought that Alice Paul, she wouldn't have wanted a, a museum per se in her name. Um, she would want us to be doing something active for the cause of equality. So we thought, you know, we, we need to preserve her name. We need people to remember who she is. We tell her story. And we do have our, our museum in her honor, but we also have our Girls Leadership Development uh, Center, and that is the heart of what we do. We work with uh, girls middle school through high school and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a series of programs from a 10-week school-based program uh, to a summertime uh, career-focused uh, program and uh, from middle school through high school and a girls advisory council that meets mm -hmm. once a month at Paulsdale. And I think if Alice Paul were alive, uh, she would like to see that kind of activity happening at her uh, home. It is, and it's a, it's a fantastic place for those of you who have not been. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, let's go ahead and switch and we'll talk to Dr. Terborg Penn for, for a minute. If you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the women that you would like to be talking about tonight and a little bit about their origins and how they got started and why you think that had such a uh, impact on their the work that they had done as they moved for as they move forward well my work is on african-american women suffragists and the various other movements that connected with the suffrage movement and temperance definitely was one of them and i look primarily in the in the 19th century and uh, end with the woman's suffrage mm -hmm. uh, ratification, amendment ratification. So I'm looking at from about 1830 to about 1920, but for today's activity, I decided to focus on the 19th century uh, black suffragists who were also temperance advocates. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most important ones, I think, was Mary Ann Chad Carey, who lived in Washington, D.C. and along with Frances Harper, who was from Baltimore. So, you know, they're, region, they're regional people, if, if you know what I mean. D.C., mm -hmm. Baltimore. Uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was born in Baltimore of, in a free black family, because if you know this, you have to understand there were two types of black populations in the 19th century, the free blacks and the enslaved blacks. And the enslaved blacks might have nominally gained their freedom in, in the Civil War era, but they were mostly uneducated, you know. They were rural people. So unless they were given a hand up, and often it was the free black community that came in and did that. And churches, ministers did it also. So many of the women learned about temperance in church. Mm -hmm. But organizing was something else again. And it was the formerly free black women who had the education and the knowledge to organize who did that. And Mary Ann Chad Carey would be a very good example of that. Um, she was originally from Delaware, moved to Washington to go to law school at Howard University. So she became a lawyer. And then she worked also for the federal government and eventually developed a group called the Colored Women's Progressive Union. And they did a variety of things, including promote for women suffrage, but temperance was an important part of that as well. Another woman who I thought was, was interesting was uh, Mamie Dillard, who came from, I can't remember if she was from Kansas or Indiana, I always have to check. I look at the movements rather than where the people are, are necessarily from. But um, I'll tell you in a minute. She was from uh, Kansas, from Lawrence, Lawrence, Kansas. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she was involved in temperance work in the 1890s. And she organized uh, several activities. 
But the main thing she did was to promote the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which had segregated unions. Yeah, Al, she, my, my girl did it. She had segregated unions. So throughout the US, whether you were in the North or in the South, you belonged to a seg racially segregated union. But Mamie had to give them credit, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, because they did provide the movement that allowed African American women to organize among themselves. So she was an important person in this. Another woman was Mary Ann McCurdy, and she was from Indiana. So you see, these are not all Southern women. In fact, the only one who's almost Southern, but not really quite, is um, Frances Harper mm -hmm. from Baltimore. And Baltimore doesn't consider themselves That's South. Not very South. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, but Maryland was a slaveholding state. Uh, McCurdy was very interested in not only women's suffrage, but temperance. And one of the things that she said was that once we get the vote, then we can work on legislation to provide in temperance, period, mm -hmm. because intemperance is killing us all. That was a very important thing, I think, you had to say, because for many poor people, whether you were black or white or whatever, you drowned your pain in liquor, alcohol. Mm -hmm. Your pain might be emotional, it might be physical. You might work so hard that you came home and, and all you wanted to do was go to the bar or, or take a bottle and it, it's the same thing now with a lot of people. So they were very important, I think, as grassroots leaders. Um, Harper, however, becomes the superintendent of colored work for the WCTU. So even on a national level, it was segregated. Mm -hmm. You had to have a black woman to supervise the black organizations nationwide. And I think uh, you have to understand that no matter where we are in the US, this whole question of race comes up, whether it's 19th century or, or today. And, um, but they found ways to overcome it and to do the kinds of things that they needed to do to help people in their own communities. Mm -hmm. And this was important because the women in the churches and most of the um, organizers would go to the black churches and start the movement rolling there. And I think that was a very good strategy. Yeah. And they tied it together. So it was not only a moral imperative, it was a political movement as well. Because you're not going to end uh, abusive alcohol mm -hmm. unless you have a political way of doing it. Right. So they combined the political as well as the moral right. in that movement. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Lori, this is a good place to have you pick up so we can talk, if you give us a little bit of information, I'd like to hear a little bit about Evanston, the History Center, but then also about the Francis Willard House um, and a little bit about um, the intersection of uh, morality and um, temperance and politics. Um, well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here, and, but I should clarify, I am not the current president of the Francis right. Willard Historical Association. I'm actually a past president, so not a big change, but I um, am the current um, director of the Evanston Women's History Project, which is what connects me to the Francis Willard House mm -hmm. and the Willard, um, the WCTU archives, which um, exist in Evanston. Um, the Willard House is um, a wonderful, amazing house museum. It's been a house museum since 1900. Probably, we're not sure, but we aren't, we can't find an earlier house museum that tells the story of a woman's life um, in the United States or mm -hmm. in the world. So a um, very early historic house museum. And then the WCTU's records, their records of their local organizations, their national organizations, and it was a worldwide organization, still is today, um, all of the records of their work for all the different things they worked on, including suffrage, um, are there. So it's, it's fun to come yeah. and tell their story. Um, so France, I'm thinking Frances Willard kind of falls in between these yeah. two groups of women. 
Um, she's um, at least one or two generations earlier yeah. than Alice Paul. She's born in 1839. She's the generation after mm -hmm. the first wave of the suffrage, um, the suffragists in the US, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, are the generation before her, really her mother's generation. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't grow up in a very progressive household. Her mother was a very progressive um, person and, and really kind of um, um, really encouraged Frances to take on whatever she wanted to do. But her father was traditional. And in some ways, her early life and um, the sense of limitations about what um, she could do and those limitations simply because she was a girl really sort of set her in motion. Um, and those early um, moments where she's noticing that her brother gets to do things like go to school and she is not allowed to go to public school until she's um, almost you know, ready to go to college. Um, she's educated at home. She wonders why. Um, there's a great moment. She traces the story of her evolution on suffrage um, to very early in her life. She does it later in her life. But she goes way back and uh, recalls a time when her brother goes to vote with her father. And she says to her sister, Mary, her younger sister, Mary, don't we love our country just as much as they do? And her sister says to her, this is a story she recounts later. So, um, But her sister says, yes, we do. But we can't say anything because we will be thought to be strong-minded. So there, <laughs> there's, there's this sense. She has this internal sense of uh, the injustice, the inequality that she faces just because she's a girl. There's no other reason. Um, and it comes very early in her life and then stays with her. Um, she doesn't become vocal about it till years later. And it's her exposure to the outside world. She travels in Europe. She becomes yep. a teacher. She you know, has a career. She starts to uh, what she get sort of um, informed about what she calls the woman question, which is sort of the way they phrased it in the mid 19th century. Um, she starts to go, I think I'm, this is where my, um, my calling is, is in, the, in figuring out the woman question. Uh, what do we do about women's equality? But then the temperance movement, the woman's temperance movement explodes in the 1870s in the US with um, the crusades that are documented in the exhibit um, where women are taking to the streets and protesting in front, praying and singing and begging saloon owners to close down because of the problems of alcohol in their little towns in Ohio. And Willard, who she's watched the temperance movement from afar, her parents are Methodists. So the uh, Methodism and temperance kind of go together. But she's not involved with it. it she's, she's sort of more in the woman question thing. And when the, the woman's movement and the temperance movement come together, she says, OK, this, I, I now see the possibilities. And what she sees is the possibilities for vast numbers of women to get, off their, mm -hmm. get out of their houses and do something. because. They might not do it for the individual right that they deserve to vote or those kinds of things, but they will do it. They will become activists if it's something about um, protecting their homes mm -hmm. and their families from a scourge like alcohol. Mm -hmm. So she sees an opportunity that there's um, this is the temper connecting the two mm -hmm. ideas is going to get, is going to um, create change in a big mm -hmm. way. So that's sort of Willard's background and kind of how she kind of um, um, got to the whole concept of, of temperance and the woman's question mm -hmm. connecting the two ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking that we were talking about early influences. Yeah. Yes. Um, but the, the, question that you asked me is about politics and the intersection between yeah. yes so, so how did they how how was the how was the um, what made them move toward the political side of 
of the issue yeah. so that they knew that that was how they were actually going to bring about change. So the WCTU, when it gets started, um, after the Crusades kind of come to a close and, and it how, looks like they're going to... What was the number you told me earlier? It was oh, an astonishing number of women that were... Members of the WCTU? Yes. 250,000 yes. 250, in 1890. By far the largest organization yeah. of women in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Yeah, and, and then it becomes a worldwide organization. Um, by 1890, it's world organiza World's Women's Christian Temperance Union. Right. Um, and um, they, you know, you can't work for the vote in every country because not every, even men don't have the vote in every country in the world in 1890. Mm -hmm. So they work on lots of other issues. Um, Frances Willard has what she calls her do everything policy, and she really means it that the temperance is in everything, and everything is in temperance. So they are a vast and comprehensive reform organization mm -hmm. in her lifetime. She dies in 1898, right. before the real push towards suffrage in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So she she's falls in that earlier generation. But um, going back to the, um, the, the, the start of the WCTU really is in, they call it the gospel temperance. It's about persuading people to change um, individually um, their, um, their alcohol use and to persuade those saloon owners to, to close their doors and to sort of individually get people signing the temperance pledge and things like that. Those early years, um, Willard is the is an officer in the WCTU. She becomes president of the WCTU in 1879. So she's the second president, and she takes it from that gospel sort of moral persuasion and the moral issue of, um, and it it still exists, but she mm -hmm. shifts it, and it becomes much more about pol politics mm -hmm. and about gaining the vote and about changing things on a much grander mm -hmm. scale. Exactly. So it's it they never give up the that the temperance pledge and you know they keep everything while they're evolving and changing. Yeah. So interesting. Now Chris, we were talking about Alice and I had mentioned earlier her single mindedness. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the the um, how Alice intersected with temperance. And I think that if you take it one step further than that and talk a little bit about the, the other reformers that she was a part of and that she was learning from, um, because she was very single-minded. She was suffrage all the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and it, it's unusual for somebody like Alice Paul, who, uh, you know, we talked to our girls about, uh, who's your shero? For, for Alice Paul, that was Susan B. Anthony, who uh, was involved in a lot of different movements. Uh, she was a labor rights activist, a temperance uh, activist, and uh, a suffragist as well, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Susan B. Anthony was, was her uh, own hero, and she picks up Anthony's federal work. Yet, uh, when Alice Paul um, uh, focuses and forms her own party, mm -hmm. she becomes very single-minded. She focuses on that 19th Amendment, and is criticized for um, for not focusing on other issues that would affect women, uh, particularly since she is successful at bringing in a lot of different types of women. She brings in different classes and different races. Uh, so, you know, women are approaching her all the time and saying, you know, why are we not focusing on, on temperance? Why are we not focusing on African American women's rights? Uh, you know, what about the mother that needs to feed her baby? Uh, and Alice Paul would say, you know, the vote first. Uh, you know, that was her message message that the vote is, is first and everything else will, will follow. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, I, I'm sure, although there are, I don't have any numbers, uh, I'm sure that a lot of her suffragists that come into the National Women's Party are also involved in the temperance movement because I know there's a huge overlap between all of those reform movements. Um, she has uh, women that are interested in temperance, she has women that are, um, she recruits a lot of factory women and they're, mm -hmm. they're in their um, labor rights activism. Um, she's working with uh, um, lower classes of women and uh, she's aware of what their needs are because she was a settlement worker, she was a social worker. Mm -hmm. So she's aware of all of these issues. Um, I think she takes lessons from each of these campaigns. However, her focus is singly on getting women the right to vote. Uh, and um, I, I think 
all of the movements definitely overlap, uh, but for Alice, her single focus is going to be 19th Amendment. Well, what becomes the 19th Amendment? The vote first, everything else mm -hmm. will figure its way out mm -hmm. or receive attention. At that point, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that Francis Willard had a do everything policy mm -hmm. and that Alice Paul had a we're going to take this one step at a time yes. and we'll get suffrage first mm -hmm. and then we'll move forward. But Alice was highly educated. Why don't you speak yes. for just a minute about mm -hmm. the, the degrees that she had? She has uh, on display at Paulsdale we have six of her degrees mm -hmm. and that's not even. She had uh, two bachelors, two masters and two doctorates. Uh, she studied biology. She studied um, uh, liberal arts or social work, mm -hmm. the early form of that program. Uh, she got a doctorate in economics, uh, and then she had her law degrees. Uh, we know that she took courses at the London School of Economics uh, and the New York School of Philanthropy. And it's through all of these uh, schools, through these programs, she's going to meet a lot of uh, uh, people who will eventually become suffragists that she's going to recruit into her movement. Um, and also through her work in the settlement movement, um, mm -hmm. she's going to meet women that will influence her, but also that she's going to bring into the movement. Uh, she's part of the college women. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when, in, when she um, coordinates this huge parade in 1913 here in D.C., uh, she encourages college women to wear their cap and gown because um, she's part of that generation of, of women who were able to go to college and receive these edu uh, this education, but also to have careers. Uh, and she was able to do that. Uh, so she is part of that um, young women's movement of the time, uh, highly educated and uh, was able to move that into a career, but then into uh, mm -hmm. to direct a movement. Mm -hmm. And Lori, you had mentioned, what was the year that um, Frances Willard passed away? 1898. 1898. So this yeah. is before. And there were debates in the WCTU about, you know, do we do one thing? Mm -hmm. Do we do prohibition? Mm -hmm. Or do we do everything like Willard wanted them to? During her lifetime, she was such a force. Yeah. Um, nobody would uh, uh, got anywhere with yeah. that conversation. And she had a but huge after following she's gone, as a speaker. Yeah, no, yeah. she was she was, you know, one of the most well-known women of her time. It's it's very strange to read accounts of her life and and look at things about her and realize how little people know her story today mm -hmm. because she was, you know, her portrait hung on people's walls next to George Washington. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but um after she's gone, the WCT really has to figure out, and they don't, they don't give up on the do everything, but so they're, they're still working on suffrage, they're still working on lots of other reforms, but they turn their eyes towards prohibition. And as the prohibition movement gains steam, then you really start to see. So the, the debate over, for reformers, I think this is probably a common debate. I don't know um, about a lot of other reform movements, but do we do one thing and focus and do it well and get it done? Mm -hmm. Or do we do try to be a broad movement where we're really trying to affect change across the board? Yeah. And you know, they they debated it and had various answers. Definitely, and it's generational too. I mean, you right? can see it. You can track the you can track yeah. the various movements, and you can see who picks up from who, and then who moves on. Yeah. The this this concept of education and whether or not they had an early. Um, access to education or early influence on education. Dr. Turborg Penn, you said something earlier that was very fascinating. You were talking about the difference between um, the two communities, and there was an enslaved community and then there were freed blacks. And it was the freed people who had access to education and could bring that to the others. But interestingly enough, Sojourner Truth mm -hmm. supported temperance. An enslaved woman from New York State yeah. who manages to gain her freedom when she's an adult and moves into the, to the reform business, period. Right. Abolition, woman suffrage, yeah. and she advocated for temperance. And, and her argument was, too many mothers complain mm -hmm. that their husbands yeah. spend all of the family money on alcohol. And she's talking about black mothers. And, and she says, oh, I know they're miserable. You know, I know they're unhappy. That's why they're drinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to drown their pain, they're using the family money. And the mothers were just up in arms. So Truth, when she was in Topeka, Kansas, believe it or not, was talking about really? how you've got to combine suffrage and temperance. Because this yeah. is the only way we're going to get 
legislation right. that's going to help the right. poor women who are suffering now. So it was a, it was a class thing as well. Right. A absolutely. Economic mm -hmm. factors in there. Yeah. yeah. The, of course. The problem of course. with alcohol, the level of the problem in those years, mm -hmm. is yes. hard for us to really wrap our brains around. We think so differently about alcohol than they did. We consume so much less. If you see the exhibit, yeah. there's jugs and it, it, that compare how much raw seven alcohol gallons, you seven gallons people per drank person. in yeah. different time for periods. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for us to kind of, and the prohibition, all, you know, it's a little bit of a joke. You know, let's, mm -hmm. it's kind of comical. Oh yeah, we're gonna ban alcohol. Does mm -hmm. anyone really think that would work, you know? But for them, it was serious business. And it was because, for, for the WCTU mm -hmm. especially, it was all those women and all the suffering mm -hmm. in all those families right. and all the children. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, if you're impoverished because someone has drank away his oh, yeah. wages yeah. Yeah. and your wages, because you do not have rights to your mm -hmm. own wages, mm -hmm. what, you know, I mean, this is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So. And it crossed race and class, mm -hmm. which I found very yes. interesting. It's fascinating. Uh -huh. Yeah. It is. Tell me a little bit more about the about the role of the church. So it wasn't just as a as a religious organization, but it was also as a, um, oh, a, a mechanism, social, social, a social movements. Yes, yeah. Um, the preachers, and it depended on, of course, the kind of preachers that you had, mm -hmm. as well as the kind of leadership among the women in the church. And for most black churches, and I'm I don't go to white churches, so I don't know. <laughs> But in the black churches that I know of, there are more women. Is this true internationally or nationally? Mm -hmm. More women in churches? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, all right. Yes. Yeah. So the women would say to the minister, we've got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted to keep his congregation from moving on to another, <laughs> he would have to uh, listen to them. And so they invited people he would invite people, or the deacons would invite mm -hmm. people who could give a social movement uh, message, not preaching, but you know, after church, mm -hmm. go down and have whatever, repass, mm -hmm. and, and then the, this person would come and speak. And uh, so Sojourner Truth did that, a lot of that. But so did these other educated women as well. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that the... Um what type of education are we talking about? It's essentially just bringing, um, aw uh, bringing awareness and also making sure that the women are seeing that there is a path out? Well, I think what they were saying is, especially this is, we're not talking about the Deep South. We're talking mm -hmm. about the North and the Middle right. West in particular. These are the places where I found this. If your men could vote, and in some of these Midwestern places, you could vote before the 19th Amendment. Right. Mm -hmm. If your men could vote, then they need to worry, they need to pressure the politicians to put this together. I suspect, even though I haven't found any evidence of this, that in some of these denominations, maybe the Methodists in particular, mm -hmm. the black preachers and the white preachers would get together and talk about, you know, why don't we bombard our people this week and talk about the reasons that we need to lessen up this drinking. Mm -hmm. um, somebody needs to do a study of that, but mm -hmm. I haven't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I find it very interesting that these connections were being made by these women. Now, Sojourner Truth was an illiterate woman. Mm -hmm. So she must have, she heard, she went to lectures, she heard, she went to, um, something like this, mm -hmm. and would gather the information. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about people reading about this right. necessarily. Right. They would often so go formal. to, but yeah. they'd go to revivals, and that I thought was fascinating. Yeah, the church was powerful yeah. in was. making this mm -hmm. spread. And, and the at WCTU the revival, they took talk advantage about of it. it. Yeah, yeah, they would talk about yeah. this at a revival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the suffrage movement, I know with Alice Paul, and her party, they're going to play upon that uh, that moral duty mm -hmm. that women have that they they you know that they would their their piousness. Um, yes. They're going to play upon that in bringing more women 
into to the suffrage ranks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that they were dishonest. They really did believe that, uh, and I think Alice mm -hmm. Paul did believe that women were the moral half of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, that's going to be a, a strong um, factor in bringing in women into that latter part of the suffrage women's suffrage movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, the Frances Willard coined a term, and she didn't coin it, but she used it strategically. She called, um, when she starts uh, yeah. advocating for the vote and, and getting the WCTU to advocate for the vote, she um, at first uh, uh, seeks the ballot in, uh, for home protection issues yes. only. Mm -hmm. And she calls it the home protection ballot. And that would be just on the saloons in your town, mm -hmm just on school boards, like we don't need the vote on everything. Mm -hmm. We just need those things that impact our home. Yeah. And women start, she sort of frames it, starts to frame this mm -hmm. idea that women bring that moral influence mm -hmm. into, the, and they, they should be, it's not outside their, this, their sphere of activity. Mm -hmm. It's just an extension of the home yes. and for them to have this kind of ballot. Yes. And then it changes over time, that's mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. in that evolution. But. They uh, start to take that phrase and turn it into municipal housekeeping, yeah. that yeah. women yeah. Yeah. will use their vote for, for moral purposes. They will help to get rid of corruption, but also feed hungry children and uh, give, give attention to those welfare causes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And all three of you have mentioned to me at different times and in different ways, but you've talked about rights versus duty. Is it a woman's right to do these things, or is it her duty to do mm -hmm. these things? Um, that was something that I think you all had talked about at one time or another. Um, and Lori, I want, you also said something that was interesting to me. You were drawing a, a parallel between the suffrage movement and the temperance movement, mm -hmm. and you were talking about the temperance movement was front-loaded, so at a very early time when you're looking at suffrage, there were an inordinate amount of women that were involved in this. Mm -hmm. And then when that started to wane a bit, then suffrage really started to well, move forward. Well, in the forward. temperance movement, um, because it's so grassroots and connected yeah. with all mm -hmm. the churches, it really has its fingers in every little yes. town in America at some point. Mm -hmm. Every county in every state has a WCTU. Like there's almost, Everywhere. it's just, it's a huge, not, yeah. You know, it's not every single, but you yeah. know, it's it's a huge organization. It has its fingers kind of everywhere. So the, it provides the grassroots for the suffrage movement mm -hmm. at a key time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't maintain that the suffrage movement. You know, there's ebbs and flows here, and it. But it at a, at a, an important time, I'd say the 1880s was mm -hmm. the time when it really was. But this is, you know, we've in in all our conversations, we've been coming up with great research projects. Yes, we have. And this is the one <laughs> that yeah. someone really could mm -hmm. explore. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. what really was that relationship of the two? We also know that a lot of um, suffrage workers who were early suffrage workers uh, move over to the temperance movement at a certain point because mm -hmm. they start to think oh, maybe this home protection idea, mm -hmm. maybe this is going to work. Maybe this is actually going to get us a vote. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should shift our focus a little bit here mm -hmm. and start working in temperance, and that's going to get the ballot quicker. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, those mm -hmm. brewers and distillers and that vast amount of money that's in alcohol um, kind of comes yeah. rearing its head. And it becomes the main anti-suffrage mm -hmm. right. um, source of the anti-suffrage mm -hmm. movement is those brewers and distillers and their national organizations. Now, so. with the black women, the 1870s is when they connect uh -huh. the temperance mm -hmm. and suffrage. And this is, of course, emancipation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is post-world, post-Civil post -Civil War, yeah. post -Civil post -Civil War. Yeah and um, Reconstruction era, mm -hmm. so there's a lot more political yeah. fluidity going. And many of the, and I think the preachers understood that too. And if you brought in some key women who could stir up the other women, it would be significant. Because they, they didn't want you wasting all your money in the bars, they wanted you to come and put your coins in the mm -hmm. church. Right. <laughs> so, 
So there are a lot of political as well as moral reasons that connect mm -hmm. this. I see a lot of this as, as a combination of things. Mm -hmm. But the political tends to be pro-family. Let's stop, let's eliminate the disintegration of families through alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, they use the word abuse, mm -hmm. which I thought was, was very, which is modern for today, very, you know. Very. So let's, that's, a good, that's a good segue for us to talk a little bit about um, the path of suffrage or the path of temperance. And women um, from different communities at different times picked one up and set the other one down, mm -hmm. depending on what they were trying to push through and what the avenue was. So was it a duty or was it a right? Mm -hmm. Was it home protection or was it because we need to get the vote to secure everything else? Let's start with Chris, who's mm -hmm. on the far end. Alice Paul is on the far end of that spectrum, which is the vote comes first. Yes. So expand on what you were talking about before. I think a little bit about that. You know, you talked about duty versus yeah. right. Um, I think Alice Paul was interesting in that uh, she gave a lot of I don't want to say lip service, but publicly, she gave a lot of respect towards this municipal housekeeping or home mm -hmm. protection, um, or towards reformers uh, and uh, this idea of the women as the helpmate, right. um, you know, the moral persuaders, uh, moral influence in society. She gave that a lot of public um, respect. Uh, she talked about it. Um, you know, she said, you know, women are the peaceful half of the world, yeah. but. Uh, I, you know, I see it in her documents and behind closed doors, uh, she is following the, uh, you know, this is our right uh, mm -hmm. uh, line of thinking. She, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, she has a, a certain understanding of the Constitution, but I think before she had studied law, she has an idea, that, and I don't know if it's from being a Quaker or uh, through her political studies and her economic studies, she believes that men and women are equal. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, she gives some attention to the woman as a helpmate, but behind closed doors, she is advocating uh, for for the woman. This is her right, um, and not necessarily that sense of of, of duty. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting because uh, she can't push that angle too much because she will lose some of her supporters. Uh, but this is definitely more radical, and it's something you know that even Elizabeth Cady Stanton struggled right. with. You know. Uh, when she talked about in one of her last speeches about, um, you know, should we be fighting for the right to vote because we are mothers or because we are women or we are human mm -hmm. beings. Uh, so I think Alice Paul would have definitely argued that. And she had a very uh, strict understanding of the Constitution and law that um, she said, you know, truly women are human beings and they need to fight for their human rights as citizens, um, not uh, to, to necessarily be helpmates but to be full equal mm -hmm. citizens with the equal standing uh, of the law. So, um, you know, she kind of always walked that fine mm -hmm. line. Um, she didn't want to make anybody angry on either side, but I think that in her heart, she leaned more towards uh, the, the vote as a right uh, for women. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> I, um, so it's so interesting because I don't think we give them a lot of, well, we do, we do but other people may not give them credit for being such strategic thinkers mm. about mm -hmm. who they're trying to <clears> persuade. <throat> yeah. Who yeah. are they trying to get to do what? And, mm -hmm. and so while Alice is, you know, having to confront the idea that she's got to, you know, embrace domestic housekeeping, mm -hmm. you know, or, um, or um, <clears throat> uh, municipal housekeeping, um, Francis is having to be strategic and really develop the whole idea of municipal housekeeping mm -hmm. and home protection. She very much, even at an early age, was all about rights. It was about rights for her, mm -hmm. but she didn't believe that if she talked a lot about rights, she would gain the kind of acceptance that she needed. In her time period, if you started talking with women about, you deserve this right, you would lose them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the whole idea of, of, of um, you are a mother, you are a sister, you are a wife, you are um, you know, a daughter, you have a moral duty. These are part of your Job. This is part of your job in the world is to protect your family from all of this to help them um, gain um, 
that protection. And it, this is just an extension of your duties in that area yeah. of your life. Mm -hmm. And so that whole development of that argument was huge for her. And she really, the, the com, you know, we, a lot of scholarship around this issue will tend to say it's either rights or it's duties. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. Most, I think most suffragists embraced both of them, mm -hmm. but just to varying degrees. And they had to do it at different times for different reasons. Yeah. And it wasn't, each argument wasn't exclusive. It's not like they said, oh, well, we're all about this one or not all about that one. Mm -hmm. So I think for Willard, it swung towards the other way. Yeah, but that was interesting because until we had the conversation a week or so ago, I hadn't really thought about picking up one of the arguments and then setting it down when it was less than palatable for a certain mm -hmm. group and then picking up the other one. And you were talking about this as well mm -hmm. because you were saying that for some, of the, for some of the women it was just a means to an end because they wanted to, they were really focused on improving the economics of their family. Mm -hmm. It came down to economics, mm -hmm. it was very simple. And they would pick up whichever one they needed. Can you tell me a little bit, Well, pick up that conversation? Yeah. The problem of course, as most of you know, is for the majority of African Americans they are either first or second generation free, okay? By the end of the 19th century. Uh, very few uh, were born out, Marianne Chad Carey's mm -hmm. family was free born living in a slave state, but Delaware is a border state. Mm -hmm. it, they're not in Alabama. So you, you find that the majority of black women who are in these positions are in the minority in terms of, of education. They are educated. They are a minority. Yeah. But their influence is significant because they were willing to interchange with the poorer women. And I think they understood that if they didn't do that, the race, as they would say, mm -hmm. is doomed. Mm -hmm. So there are practical, as I said, as well as mm -hmm political and moral reasons for all of this. I didn't find anybody who wasn't a suffragist, who was mm -hmm. a temperance advocate. Mm -hmm. All of the temperance advocates that I found, I found as suffragists. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, look, after I finished my dissertation, which was on African Americans in general who supported women's suffrage, mm -hmm. I decided to focus on the women in particular and built from there, I didn't find anybody who didn't think that the primary goal was getting the right to vote mm -hmm. because once you get the right to vote, then you have political power. Yes. So um, morality is one thing, but the ability to implement the policies that you want is something else again. Right. So you have to be able to have the ammunition to do that and the vote of the ballot, ballot box was the ammunition. Yeah. So for African Americans, I think they're very pragmatic mm -hmm. about this whole yeah. thing. With the, with the fact that economy, economic factors, oh, yeah, is underlying for all of these mm -hmm. different groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, it's, it's very clear. Let's, we have a few more minutes before we'll <laughs> open it up to questions from the audience, but I wanted to talk a little bit, have you, you each talk a little bit about the two more things for the movement. First off, we know that there wasn't a lot of, um, there was a lot of overlap with picking up one um, piece and putting it down and then picking up temperance, for instance, and then moving mm -hmm. that forward. So we know that a lot of the groups went back and forth pretty easily. It doesn't matter what their reasoning was, it's just that they went back and forth very, very often. But we, we tend to hear a little bit more about that there was, um, uh, less than collegial working between um, all of the women. A little bit about the individuals. You had said um, at one point that, um, that there were several women, and including Frances Willard, who specifically put down one um, task like temperance and moved right into suffrage depending on who she was talking to. So it's definitely based on the different audience groups, mm -hmm. but it was also according to the time. So since we're talking about different time frames here in different generations, maybe we can talk a little bit about that intersection. So say for instance, I mean, Frances Willard had passed before Alice was even, was mm -hmm. she even in England by then? I think so. Was she, was Just, she? 
No, not quite. Yeah. But she. Mm -hmm. But this was very, very yeah, early on. Yeah, the settlement, on. the men is just growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. No, it, it's definitely the generation before. So what what happened after Frances Willard um, had died? Where, where um, did that part of the movement I'm not go? The, um, the, the expert on the WCTU after her death is a whole yeah. other story um, and a very interesting story. But um, the they do turn, they do as an organization, they, they it's hard. She was such a, a figure in their world. Um, they have a wonderful headquarters building in downtown Chicago uh, built for them by Daniel Burnham. Huge skyscraper in the middle of the loop. Um, and wow. they decide that they're going to move their headquarters to the little house, our little Victorian cottage oh. in Evanston. So um, her death really, really shook them. It came suddenly. She was young. She was a very, very active reformer. And mm -hmm. boom, she gets the flu. And she wasn't well in those later years mm -hmm. in her life, but she uh, died of influenza. So. Um, so it's, they're really shook and they really struggle with their focus. Mm -hmm. And I think that also causes them to, you know, when you lose a key leader, right. mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but then they, they shift their focus and they come back strong and that's when prohibition really right. is their thing. Right. Um, but they, they didn't give up on everything else. It was always a do everything movement a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so. there, it's still an obviously it's still an active organization, and that's not where you you're not in that organization, but they are active. And mm -hmm. you had said something about um, the influence that they have globally, yeah, not the, just um, in America. So uh, they are still a worldwide organization. One mm -hmm. of their largest. Um, I just was in India and visited with the mm -hmm. WCTU of India, um, in their headquarters in Delhi. Um, yeah, so it's it's their. Um, they've changed. It's not <laughs> the same organization it was a hundred, but it's still existing. Yeah. Still fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing. In India, right? In yeah, India. I know. So, and largely Christian, you said. I know, said. and largely Christian. Which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, um, so but, Chris, so um, obviously Alice was, um, and her and her group, the National Women's Party, was um, successful at uh, getting suffrage passed, and then of course ratified. That was not the end of her quest, though. That was, again, sort of a means to an end. So sure. talk a little bit about the next few decades for Alice and what she, what she was doing. Um, even as uh, she's taking her celebratory photos uh, when women get the right to vote, she's already has, she says that's a foot in the door, um, but uh, she already knows that there needs to be more legislation, particularly in the Constitution. Uh, so she did write the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, it was introduced in 1923 uh, and introduced into every session of Congress from 1923 uh, until 1972. And she's going to dedicate uh, the rest of her life working for the ERA uh, in the United States. Um, she is going to do work uh, abroad, though. She will start the World Woman's mm -hmm. Party headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. And she's working for um, women's suffrage internationally, but also um, all kinds of legislation that's going to affect women, everything from custody to uh, citizenship um, uh, to wages uh, and um, uh, you know um, uh, things that would affect women legally. Uh, but really, the ERA is is the heart of. Uh, what she is doing after 1920, um, and uh, you know, in her uh, very later years, um, she is going to encounter the uh, women's liberation movement, and it's kind of interesting because all mm -hmm. of these issues, all of this overlap of issues, is going to come back to her. Uh, and people are going to be critical of her. You know, why are you not paying attention to mm -hmm. um, uh, the civil rights movement? Right. Why are you not paying attention to um, mothers who need daycare services? Uh, and she said the same thing again. She said, well, when we get the ERA, uh, we will be able to address all of these issues legally uh, in, a, it, it, you know, in the court system. So um, she dedicates her life towards the ERA and even uh, in her, her final years, in her 90s, she is um, starting to speak to reporters because 72, Congress did pass the Equal Rights Amendment, mm -hmm. but it goes to the states for ratification. So it's in this time period where she kind of knows that it was given that seven-year mm -hmm. deadline. It was extended to 10 years. And I think she knew 
in her heart that um, it was going to have a hard time getting the full ratification. Uh, and indeed, that is what happens. By 1982, the ERA falls three states short of ratification. So I always joke, if Alice Paul were alive today, she'd stop the presentation as it is and oh, yeah. put you all to work on the Equal Rights Amendment. Yes, she she'd have you on the phone. She'd have you yeah. all over social media. Um, she truly believed in this document. And again, that single focus was on let's get it into the Constitution, we'll give women a legal leg to stand on, right. and then we'll work on all of these other issues uh, that are, have come up during the suffrage movement, yeah. but that came up again during women's liberation and continue today. Yeah. What year did she die? 1977. She was 92 years yeah. old and still yeah. on the phone trying yeah. to get the ERA passed. And she worked She worked in the house, the, yes. the, the Sewell Belmont house. Mm -hmm. She worked in the house until 1974, mm -hmm. 75. Yes. Until wow. she couldn't walk up yes. the steps. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. So mm -hmm. it's interesting generationally because we had said earlier that, you know, Alice and, and that generation of suffragists were the young upstarts. So, you know, yes. they were the new generation that came mm -hmm. in and started, you know, again, militant type strategies and really moving that forward. And they were, they were seen as the, the newest of what's going forward with suffrage mm -hmm. and leaving some of the older generations behind. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a place in Alice's life just over, you know, just tracking over her life. Mm -hmm. And she then becomes, and the women of the National Women's Party, become the older generation. Yes. And so there are plenty of younger women who are organizing at that time. Think about it, obviously, the 60s and 70s. They are organizing for lots of different movements themselves. And mm -hmm. Alice and her group become the older generation. Yes. They were literally called the, the old women on the hill exactly. by, uh, I think, Gloria Steinem. Yeah. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. my. <laughs> yeah. wow. What goes on there. <laughs> but it is. I mean, and you can see it generationally. It mm -hmm. is. Absolutely. Dr. Turborg penn talk, can you tell us a little bit about, because in our, in our earlier conversations, we didn't really have a chance to get into this, but I'm interested to know um, what about the next generation of, of African-American women? What was, where did they go from after they formulated in the church and they were working on economic you issues the and voting century issues. suffragists. Mm -hmm. Well, they hated Alice Paul. <laughs> they called her Def a racist. Definitely. And um, Mary Church Terrell, I don't know how many of you know that name. Mm -hmm. There's a, is there a, a high school or a junior high school Terrell? Yeah. After her husband, Judge. But, but Mary Church Terrell lived in D.C. for many, many years and was the first president of the National Association mm -hmm. of Colored Women. She said, we've got to be pragmatic about this, you know. And she said, but then Alice Paul just got to her to the point where she told the leaders of the NAACP, Walter White in particular, oh, she just, I just can't deal with her anymore, he said. Let's be practical. She's got the power, mm -hmm. so you've got to deal with, we've got to deal with her. But black suffragists considered her to be quite a racist. Mm -hmm. And um, Mary Church Terrell tells Walter White, you know, if she could get away with this amendment being for white women only, she would do it. I, I found that in the Mary Church Terrell yeah. papers, which are at the Library of Congress. And, uh, Walter, and the NAACP papers are there, too. And I was mm -hmm. able to corroborate. You know, I said, oh, yeah. this is hot. And I looked at it, <laughs> and, and Walter White, said, yeah, I know, I know. We all know that, but you know, let's not yeah. make any big fuss. You, you can't walk around her or get rid of her, so you're going to have to work with her. Mm -hmm. Classic racist. Well, the, um, the issue of equality and the, um, the upbringing of Alice, can you mm -hmm. add anything to that? Because we do know definitely what, you know, when, she had, when she was organizing and when there was a choice to be made between um, uh, more populous southern states that wouldn't mm -hmm. have participated mm -hmm. if African American women had been given right. the same rights to participate in parades she or whatever they were. To the end. She <laughs> said, "She said we will err on the side of the numbers right. and we will bring in the bigger groups." Right. Mm -hmm. right. So it's a it's a difficult situation to look at it back through today's eyes and think, "Well, we certainly wouldn't make that same call today. Yes, we wouldn't we make would. that choice." We yeah. would. Yes, we well, would. I had maybe we to would. deal with it. <laughs> with you. I hate to say it, but the way things have been in recent years, 
just a variety of, of unfortunate things that have happened in the news. And that's the thing. Mm -hmm. We see everything. People snapping everything. So you, you see everything that, that, that's happening. Um, it's just has, it's covert now because you can't be overt about it and get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, but things have changed, but they haven't changed that much. No, it's not utopia yet. No, no, it's no, not, no, no, Which, but you, no. But you've got to keep on fighting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that's, that's basically what the NAACP, the National uh, Association of mm -hmm. Colored Women's Groups, they all decided on the same strategy. Mm -hmm. We have to do what we can covertly because we know that if we overtly cry for mm -hmm. all this, there'll be some, like Alice Ball, who would, would say, no, we don't need them, you know. Yeah. We need the Southern vote, Southern white vote first. Right. And you were, right. you know, it, earlier you were talking about the WCTU and the segregated mm -hmm. union. Yeah, yeah, they were, it was definitely yeah. a challenge for them because they knew they could grow. Right. They knew there was yep. a lot of church women out there who were big supporters, mm -hmm. and they knew they needed to grow in the South. And so how do we grow in the South? And how do we get white women involved? And how do we get black women involved? Yeah. And how do we tow this very difficult yeah. line? They didn't always do what we would want right. them to mm -hmm. do. You know, right. and, they, and they definitely found themselves in some quandaries mm -hmm. about the choices that they made. Yeah. And not all of them were good choices yeah. or choices yeah. we would approve of right. today. Right. But they were, they struggled, um, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think Alice Paul is interesting because um, she's a Quaker, uh, but also um, she is charged with racism. I think that we are seeing her through a lens, uh, honestly, um, because when it comes down to the hard choices, she did give credence to those Southern white women uh, mm -hmm. in that parade and, and later on. Um, but uh, while Carrie Chapman Catt's winning plan includes a compromise in southern states to fight for white suffrage, Alice Paul does not uh, settle for a compromise in yeah. southern states. She's going to advocate for a federal women's suffrage mm -hmm. amendment. Um, so I do know that she does have to negotiate with, uh, you know, lots of different groups, but, um, uh, you know, I think that... Uh, um, there's, there's still more research to be done yeah. uh, when it comes to, to Alice Paul and what's happening behind the scenes. One I of wish the someone things I'd like to know more about is the WCTU had national conventions. Mm -hmm. and yes. Everyone was invited, all unions, everybody mm -hmm. sent a representative. Yeah. And that meant there were African American mm -hmm. women right. at those yeah. meetings, those national mm -hmm. meetings. And I'm wondering who, oh, what other women's organization yeah. at the time had. But when they both, met with the superintendent of colored work. Well, they met in the general right, meeting, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. And they were on the stage. They were, If they were yeah. a superintendent, mm -hmm. they were speaking and giving reports. Yeah. It's something I don't know a lot about, to be honest. It's, I just, I'm curious about it. Yeah. I really would like to know, you know, really how integrated was it? Mm -hmm. Was it integrated mm -hmm. really at all or only a little bit or... You know, how really was it? Yeah. And I, do, I don't know for sure. I don't sure, know about but. the national meetings, but my speculation is if you have a superintendent of quote unquote colored work mm -hmm. who's sitting on the stage, I'm sure she was because she was part of that mm -hmm. centralized leadership, um, you might all meet in the same place, but they had a colored section. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure, but I bet they did. I wonder. Yeah, I that's bet they what did. I, wonder. I bet they had a colored yeah, section. Yeah, I wonder if they because did. Because that's what life was like. Yeah. Right. I wonder if the Southern women would, you know, want, I don't know. This is, this is a yeah. great research As long problem. as they didn't have to sit with black women in the pews, yeah. Yeah. they'd be fine because yeah. the black women would be in the last row. I wonder. So that, that would be fine. But then, I would think. But the idea that they would get a superintendent of colored work and not just completely ignore the black women, I think is yeah. significant. But you, understand, you have to also understand the majority of black people in that time period lived in the southern states, mm -hmm. the formerly mm -hmm. uh, slave states. Yeah. So you, you don't have that much lobbying from black people in the north because the 
the majority of people are still in the South. You don't get that migration until right after World War I, which is what? Two or three years before the, mm -hmm. the uh, ratification of the amendment. Right. So you still have this very significant Southern black population. Mm -hmm. And although you had educated people, because you have these, what we call today, these historically black colleges throughout the South, most of which were founded in the 1870, from the 1870s, Howard, I think, was, what, 1870-something, to about the turn of the century. So you still had a significant number of them. And this is where your so-called black elite were being educated. Right. Were they co-educational? Oh, yeah, Pretty most, much most, of them, most of them were. Oh, okay. In fact, I'm, I don't think I can read. I don't know if, oh, now see Spellman and Morehouse. Might have been all male. All, yeah. Morehouse was across the mm -hmm. street from Spellman. So it was like, you know, your boyfriend was across the street. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And they were organized in the, the 80s or 90s. Um, so you had, I know of at least those two. Right. Um, there's also one in, in, in Virginia, which, I'll, which will come to me in a minute. But the majority of, of what we call HBCUs now, historically black colleges mm -hmm. and universities, were co-ed. Mm -hmm. And most of the people were what we would call middle class. You know, the doctors and the mm -hmm. lawyers' children, mm -hmm. went the post, post office people who often had uh, political appointments. Um, the rich farm owners, because mm -hmm. you did have some. Mm -hmm. These are, the, and then you had people from the north who would send their children to these schools in the south because there were very few. Um, there were some in Philadelphia. Right. Uh, in fact, Cheney University was that early antebellum black school that eventually became Cheney University in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But this idea of you can't get rid of them, you know, so you have to sort of work around them, <laughs> is uh, because we do need them for some things, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It is. But you had to have a professional group to maintain this segregated yes. society. Yeah. yeah, it is. And I think if, if we've come up with, if, I don't know that we've come up with any answers here tonight. We've probably just come up with a whole host of new questions mm -hmm. um, that are begging for certainly um, scholarly research. I would, I would mm -hmm. hope that there's a whole list that we could, of questions that we could come up with. I know, that, um, I know that Lori and Chris have said that many times before. So we have probably about 15 more minutes that we can take questions from the audience. And they can be general questions or they can be questions directed to a certain person. Um, but if you would like to go ahead and start queuing up. There are microphones on both sides. You could queue up on either side. He and He did, and he's, <laughs> he's fast, so we'll just go ahead and start with him. So the word tempering, <clears throat> to my understanding, means moderation. It doesn't mean abstinence. When did the group switch from reduce alcohol consumption to cutting it off entirely? Was women's Christian, whatever, was it? <laughs> Was it ab abstinence from the beginning, or was it moderation and they switched? It was abstinence. They just yeah. used the word temperance. Yeah. Um, yeah, the word, the language is really important, right? We know that. Were the words people use, and um, yeah, the the that's what they meant. The 19th yeah. century, when they're talking the temperance movement, yeah. they 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 don't use the word prohibition right away. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when that word. Mm -hmm kind of comes in. It may come in earlier. I, I, I just don't know. But um, it's woman's, by the way. If you want to spell it correctly, yeah. you use the A. Yes, A. Plural, woman's mm -hmm. Christian temperance yep. union. Yep, interesting. So. Why don't we switch to right over on this side? I guess this is for whoever might know the answer. Um, in both the temperance and suffrage movement, what role did men play? particularly in leadership. I mean, did they sort of take over when they got in, or did, did women? In the were, temperance yeah. movement, men were, in the WCTU, men were not allowed yeah. to be leaders at all. Yeah. Um, uh, Francis Willard called the WCTU the WCTU University mm. because it was a training ground 
for women yeah. to be leaders. Mm. It really was all about women's leadership. Um, yeah. And women were, women ran the meetings. If they, she knew that if men were allowed to have a role as a leader, that the women would defer to them. Mm -hmm. So they weren't allowed. It was yeah. not allowed. Um, yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was very consciously that way. Yeah. It wasn't it was that way with suffrage, though. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that way with suffrage. Because at Seneca Falls, they had men, a man, right. I yes. forget who it was, who chaired the, sure. the, the thing. And Frederick yeah. Douglass was there. Yeah. And, um, he was there and he spoke. It was the streets of Boston, I believe. Yeah. Was that what? I okay. Think it was. Yeah. Yes. yes, it was. So, yeah. and throughout, and I think that that was um, deliberate because you're not going to get men to listen to the women. So you need male surrogates to speak for them because it's the men who can vote, mm -hmm. right. you know. So I, I can see the madness, method in that madness. <laughs> You, you know, with Alice Paul's party, it was it was women. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, uh, there was a joke about Alice's cousin uh, one time uh, it, it, after the Second World War. He was a soldier and he stayed at the Sewell Belmont. And she mm -hmm. said, "You're the only man has stayed at the Sewell Belmont." I thought that was kind of yeah. interesting. Um, they actually did have a contingent of men that marched in mm -hmm. the 1913 mm -hmm. parade. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah. they're certainly supporters. And they, yeah. uh, we know that um, she worked with a team of, of lawyers, uh, that you know, there's one gentleman that really goes to bat uh, as an attorney for the yeah. suffragists. Uh, he's a, a real supporter. Um, but there's also some funny stories of Alice Paul. You know, when these lawyers would come in, uh, she would have them do work, like you know, put some stamps on these envelopes, and they never did that before because nobody ever treated them as secretaries. Uh, so I think that she definitely, um, the Sewell Belt or the headquarters, yeah. definitely was uh, all female almost consistently. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they certainly had their male supporters, but did yeah. not let them not take leadership, leadership positions. And, and the temperance mm -hmm. movement had all sorts of men's organizations, you know, organizations that were mostly men, the Anti-Saloon mm -hmm. League, the Prohibition Party, mm -hmm. all sorts of, there were all sorts of men involved in temperance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that they didn't need that, you know, that part yeah. of it, that activity. Yeah, they didn't. Fascinating. Right here. Um, yes, lots of questions raised, so much more to learn, and actually what you were just saying touches on one of the thoughts that popped up for me was uh, temperance, the push for temperance, I was wondering if that had an impact on sort of turning a lot of men off the idea of women getting the vote because, hey man, you know, we, you know, or at least if they didn't drink themselves, a lot of men say, no way do you let these women get the vote because I don't want to lose my right to drink. Um, but that's not my main question. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a white paper on um, the history of social movements in the U.S. and where I, my sense is they've typically broken down around race and class. Mm -hmm. Uh, my understanding was that the uh, women's movement sort of grew out of the abolitionist movement. A lot of the w middle class women got their training mm -hmm. uh, in the abolitionist movement. And uh, there were also a lot of working class women involved early on. Mm -hmm. But then when, I don't know, 1840s, 1850s, you had all of those bloodbaths going on, you know, at, at the factories in Lowell and the, and the mining camps out west with just, there were just you know, so, so many people, thousands of people, uh, poor people dying. And uh, my understanding was some of the, the suffragettes saying, but just cross the picket line. You know, mm -hmm. just, just, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just really not getting the, the poverty conditions and the life and death conditions of the working class women. So they mostly left. Well, the suffragettes saying, but hey, if you get the vote, it's all going to be good. But they said, but our men have the vote, and it's not good. It's not working. So, and then after uh, the civil rights, after, after the Civil War, when black men got the vote, that made a lot of the white women angry, um, and my understanding is it basically turned their back. A lot of racism um, down in the South with the racist banners in those suffragists. In the North, too, do you? It, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so basically, in a break, breaking Frederick Douglass's heart, who'd been a strong advocate for women's rights, so 
And it wasn't until the labor movement started really picking up at the at the height of the you know uh, at the end of the uh, 1900s I'm uh, I'm sorry 1800s. Uh, at the labor movement really started picking up that a lot of the working class women did return to the movement because they said, well, okay, now we have a chance that getting the vote is going to make a difference. So it was their numbers and their energy that really uh, helped the, the suffrage movement to, to move along more. So that just, my question in my white paper was, gee, I wonder if white middle class women hadn't turned their backs on or had more uh, uh, support for poor working class women mm -hmm. and hadn't turned their backs on uh, their African American uh, partners mm -hmm. um, and it let, let you know the blood baths in the South and all the lynchings go on for, for years and years. Geez, how many, if, how much larger a movement it would have been mm -hmm. And would suffrage not have happened maybe a lot sooner, along with a lot of other human rights? So had there not been the economic and the racial divide early on with the backlash and the backlash that came from that, would the movement have perhaps progressed right. even earlier? Yeah. And are possibly. we going? I, I, that that was my question yeah. in my white paper. Mm -hmm. And and when are we going to learn that lesson? <laughs> you know. So definitely. Well, thank you. Well, but yeah. one of the problems is this whole question of states' rights. Mm -hmm. Most of mm -hmm. these activities, I mean, it's the same with getting an amendment through. You've got to get the states to support it first. Local, locally, you have to work on these mm -hmm. amendments before you can actually say the amendment has been, can be ratified. So a lot of this had to deal with local politics. Mm -hmm. So it's a states' rights issue. So it varies from region to region and from state to yeah. state, the type of population you have. I don't know, I think we were lucky to get it, period, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Oh, and oh, I, have a, yeah. I have a feeling it had to do with, deal with the, the war effort was the, <coughs> the changes yeah. that came about because of World War I. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, more so than, yeah. than anything else. Yeah, it didn't it pass by one vote? And that was the irony of it. Even though uh, the, the whites, the, 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 white, the, the suffrage movement had actually become racist uh, when, when they felt that it would uh, serve them to, to convince particularly the, the white Southern uh, legislators. Then the irony was, for all of that, didn't, we, didn't suffrage just pass by one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. male vote? Yeah. Uh, a senator, was it, or mm -hmm. a, a congressman from Tennessee, from Tennessee whose yeah. mother sent him a telegram that night yeah. and said, if you don't <laughs> vote for women, I will never, you know, yeah. so he switched yeah. his vote. And that's, you know, so, so for all the selling out of African Americans, what did it, did it, did it, yeah. it didn't work, that strategy. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah, I don't know that you could, I don't know that you could make a definitive answer either way frankly, because mm -hmm. it's trying to prove what didn't happen. So you, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite difficult to try to do that. But like we said, we can, it's certainly a, a topic that I hope, I hope more sure. people address mm -hmm. um, and move forward with on a scholarly application because mm -hmm. we, you know, Lori at Evanston, um, uh, Chris at Alice Poe Institute, myself at the National Women's Party, there are repositories of documents that you know, we may know generally what we have. They may be loosely cataloged, but they are, I mean, it's years and, and decades mm -hmm. worth of, of good, solid research materials that no one has just gone through. Simply because when you have tens and tens of thousands of documents, you know, and a small staff, you, you simply aren't going to be able to get through that. So there are plenty of ways that I think we could look back on that history and find ways to improve ourselves today. Absolutely. I just think we just need to mm -hmm. hopefully work so that we're making sure that organizations are supported and that um, small repositories are not really forgotten because mm -hmm. then no one has access to the research. And that, that I think, would be the true um, worst thing that could possibly happen is if we just close up the boxes on this history and nobody takes a look at it. I think that's, that's just it would be a complete waste. So I think we have, we have one more question here, and then I think we might have time for one more question after that. But 
We'll see how well, far we get. First of all, I want to thank you, ladies. I would love to do a semester with all of you, so <laughs> that would be a grand delight. I have a tiny question and then a, a, a slightly broader question. You mentioned the metric of seven gallons. Was that per person per week? How? What was? I did not get the rest of that. I think it that. was per person per year. Per person per so year. So as, as okay. an adult, they would drink seven gallons yeah. of alcoholic beverages per raw, person per raw, year. Raw alcohol. Got it. Raw okay. Alcohol. Correct. All right. Yeah. Okay. And I, there, it's different depending on the year. So who knows yeah. what year is that? Yeah. 1810 or yeah. I'm yeah. Not I, sure. I know. I know it was it's bad. A it's a huge amount. <laughs> yeah. Over the top. Yeah. Uh, my broader question, and Roslyn, perhaps you could provide a, a strong, strong answer here. Probably you too, Chris. It's my understanding that in that March third, nineteen thirteen parade, that Alice Paul had asked African American women to march in the back. My perception was that was a very unwise uh, strategic decision. Does your perception go back to that decision in terms of the, the bundling of uh, perception of racism of others uh, as to who she was? They knew she was a racist before that happened. OK. All right. And the key person, again, was Mary Church Terrell. Yeah who was, at the time, the outgoing president of the National Association of Colored Women. She was the past president, mm -hmm. but she was the first. So she had lots of influence. Terrell was there. Terrell marched. And she, just, she said to the women, we're going to go to the end of the line, because they want us to get mad and go home. So no, we'll go to the end of the line. Besides, they were in DC, which was a segregated city anyway. So, um, but I don't think people forgot. This just magnified their dislike of her, of Alice Paul. Yes. That's, well, that's it. I, I, I want to clarify, Alice Paul did not ask these women to march at the back of the line. No. It was, she was, mm -hmm. uh, there were large pressure from Southern white women. Uh, so that was the compromise given. Alice actually did not make that decision even. Uh, she left it to her pageant director. Uh, and the people mm -hmm. who organized the procession that, uh, and I think part of the compromise was to get that contingent of men to sure. march, uh, you know, in between the southern white women or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I argue that Alice Paul was not a racist. Uh, it would not have been accepted in her family. Yeah. Uh, her reputation may have been there because she does give to the southern white women, she does have to give in to their demands uh, because they are a majority for the most part. Uh, they have a huge uh, influence in the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is highly racist uh, at times, uh, yeah, particularly in yes. D.C. Yes. But yes. whether she was or not, the perception was that yes. she mm -hmm. was. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now, and I, I remember here, the story is that um, who is it that breaks the line? Who, who? Uh, Ida Wells. Ida, Ida, Ida. Yes. 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 And I believe it's an Evanston woman that welcomes her. Catherine yeah. Wall yes. McCulloch, uh -huh. mm -hmm. is, who's from Evanston. Yes. Yes. Good old Evanston. Um, good old Evanston. Good old <laughs> Evanston. <laughs> who, which you know has its own issues too. Well, yes. Believe yeah. me. <laughs> believe me. Yeah. But you know, at this moment, uh, there's yeah, it's an Evanston yeah. woman who. Sure. There's a lot Welcome of drama. Welcome to be well. Yeah, a lot oh, yeah. of drama. Lots oh, of drama. Well, are you aware in 2013 when we did the 100-year march here, mm -hmm. which I participated in, yep. and it was heralded by the African-American women's sorority mm -hmm. that Delta had Sigma only been Theta. in existence for a couple of weeks and back in 1913. Mm -hmm. right. Delta it was Sigma a heavy, heavy, Which is not heavy, mine, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it was a heavy African-American march to, to honor it. Mm -hmm. and. I don't know. We, did you march in it? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> ironically, just because it, it, it yeah. did. And ironically, because they had done such a wonderful job of organizing, it ended up being the white women that were in the back of that yeah. parade. Okay. So those of us that kind of yeah. knew the history kind of looked yeah. at each other and, and laughed a bit. Anyway, that's all I have. But again, thank you, ladies. You've been delightful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think one more. Uh, my question is for Chris, and I'm just wondering um, what was Gloria, or I'm sorry, what was Alice Paul's relationship with new wave feminists such uh, as Gloria Steinem, um, if any, especially during the struggle for the ERA? I love that question because while Alice was the younger 
uh, generation of suffragists uh, and had to go up against what she called the old guard, uh -huh. uh, it kind of turns on its head by the 1960s and 70s. So she sees, you know, Gloria Steinman calls her the old woman on the hill. Um, she sees these, um, I, I'm not gonna say young women, but she sees this younger movement, this younger women's liberation yeah. movement. Oh, they are and younger. Yes, compared, compared to her, yes. To her. <laughs> but um, so she gives, again, she gives publicly, she says, yes, this is our, our next generation. They're the next generation of women to take up the mantle, right? Yeah. Um, behind closed doors, she's very concerned about um, the, this movement. Uh, the National Organization for Women, their, their platform has, what, seven different uh, parts, components to it. Uh, everything from how women are represented in the yeah. media, to, to daycare and, and ultimately abortion is going to come in yeah. uh, as a major issue as well. So she says um, behind closed doors she is very concerned about this new movement that they will stumble out the gate is her words. That she's yeah. very concerned that there's, they have too many things that they want to focus on that they will, um, they will lose focus, they will not be able to hone in on one thing and they also didn't have a, a central leader. Uh, so she kind of foreshadows how effective is this movement going to be uh, without one goal and, and one strong uh, leader, or at least one team of leaders. Um, so again, to the media, she says, hurrah, uh, and good luck, ladies. But behind closed doors, she's very yeah. concerned about what these young women are going to do with her yeah. movement and her ERA. Mm -hmm. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, and there is still plenty of um, plenty of um, questions to get answered. I mean, obviously, as the as the movement, as the women's movement has moved forward out of the '60s and '70s and into the '80s, and these are things that we're still addressing. Certainly, you can't, and as we are coming up on an election year, you simply can't turn on the TV or um, the radio without hearing something about the women's vote and mm -hmm. who's doing what and what the organizations are saying and that sort of thing. So it's and definitely stay, stay tuned because we've got a hundred years of women voting we do coming in 2020 Centennial for suffrage yeah. is in so, 2020 so yes there's a lot and there's a lot of work might i say to be done before then so mm -hmm. that we can um, celebrate that in the manner that that we should be i think we are completely out of time tom i'm Got fairly it. certain That's we are <laughs> excellent well thank you all very much for coming tonight and, and being here and for all of your and for all of your excellent questions we have um literature from the organizations out on the table um, directly out uh, outside of the theater and there's contact information for people as well so we can certainly share that if you had a question but you didn't get you didn't get to it so we'd be happy to, to pass that along all right